Well, hey everyone, welcome back. This is take 1,700 that we've tried to get this morning. We've been sitting here for about five minutes trying to get a solid uh, welcome for everybody. So, hey guys, how's it going? It's good. Yeah, yeah. it uh, it's been an interesting week. Hey, we are coming off of something uh, really exciting in the life of our church, and it's kind of hilarious because uh, Luch isn't here today. Uh, we did ordain him on Sunday. Yeah, now he's gone. And uh, <laughs> then we kicked him out. So, uh, yeah. But that was definitely something yeah. that uh, is valuable in the life of our church. I actually think that it, it leads uh, well into our first question here and kind of mm. what we're going to talk about initially. So, a few months back, we received a set of questions from a very thoughtful individual We've addressed a few of those, and then we've kept some of them, and we're working through how best to maybe address some of those, and uh, and just how to really do it thoughtfully, as well as having received other questions in the meantime. Right, right. Which, again, please, uh, if you have questions for us, continue to send those to us. You can email us, or you can call our Google Voice number and leave uh, a voicemail, or you can text that number, I believe. Any of those ways, we just welcome more questions from you guys so that we can continue to add value to what we're doing here at Southridge. So let's dive in to this first question and kind of talk about what we're doing in response. Uh, some things that we aren't, we were already doing, uh, right. but I think that uh, fit into what this person is asking. So it says, uh, what does church, what does a church look like that reaches all sorts of lost or wandering people uh, but also speaks truth and loves and encourages and enables people to use their gifts. I would say, upon reading this question, that we desire that Southridge Church would be a church that reaches all sorts of lost and wandering people, uh, that speaks the truth, but also loves, encourages, and enables people to use their gifts. I think that description fits what we desire yeah, for Yeah, I, I had... I. Quite frankly, I had kind of a silly and even snarky response in mind to that question, <laughs> because to me, uh, it, the question is, what does a church look like that does these things? And my answer is, it looks like a church. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, uh, to me, it, it's an interesting question, uh, and I think a good one in our context, um, uh, because th- the sad reality is not every church looks that way. Yeah, I think it's almost the... What does it's an church, indictment what, of yeah. what the American church and what our church in, in 2023 often looks like. Yeah. Uh, and so it's that's just an interesting question yeah. to me. I try to remember that everybody's lost and broken. That's you know, right. Whether upper class, middle class, lower <laughs> class, um, everybody is lost and broken and has experienced pain and hurt in their lives. Yeah, Until they've sure. been saved and healed by Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> of course. Yeah, and I think that that helps to just remain uh, in a mindset where we're humanizing people. That's right. Um, I, I just had this conversation with somebody recently talking about um, some struggles they were having with uh, with different people. And I just said, hey, man, like you just got to remember that people are lost. And they're doing the best they can. Most of the time when we look at people and they're going through life and they're they're making mistakes or they're doing things that we may find offensive that they're just living according to the best way they know how and trying to to navigate life and life's hard and it's important to remember that that's how we need to think about people um and not just uh, identify behavior and see behavior as the person but see behavior as a result of people being lost and, mm-hmm. and just really honestly doing the best they can to try to to navigate life and, and figure out what this is all about. That's and, the, uh, I mean, the principle I try to live by, um, and I'm not always successful at practicing it out, but just remembering that all people were created by God in the image of God for the glory of God. Yeah. Um, you know, keeping that in mind first in the conversation, hey, this is this is a person who was created by God here in His image and for His glory. Yeah, um, I just find that that grid helpful to walk through. And there's a there's a statement that I heard years ago. I've heard it, you know, several times uh, since. But it's one that initially I struggled really hard with, and then the more that I've allowed it to sort of. Uh, echo in my mind, the more I believe it's true, and the more I believe it helps me to see people really, truly uh, in truth, is that everybody that you encounter is doing the best they can. Mm. And so, when you think about that, like, it's hard initially, I think, when uh, 
you're thinking about behaviors that you don't like that people do. It's really hard to want to give them the benefit of the doubt. Hey, they're doing the best they can. But when you really apply that across the board, like you think about the ways that maybe your parents failed you. It's like they were doing the best they could. Mm. They were doing it for the first time. Like, they, they, you know, I, I, I grow up now. I'm 37 years old and realize that there is no point at which adults just like figure out. And, and know what they're doing. It's like, I still right. kind of feel like, oh, <laughs> I recognize now that life is just a whole lot of figuring things out in real time. There's no point at which you ever really feel like, oh, I understand completely how this all works and exactly the right thing that I should do in every moment. Like, that point doesn't come. And so, when you can apply that to other people and realize that everybody's just kind of like doing the best they can. It's a really helpful way to like, like the word you said was humanize people and yeah. to really see them as people and not as objects to your happiness or to you experiencing joy or to, you know, objects of frustration. That's, yeah. That's a really helpful thing to say. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think I first read that principle, uh, in a book by Brene Brown and, um, she was asking other people, you know, Hey, are, are people doing the best they can in general? And uh, I think it was her husband that responded to the question by saying, I don't know. Like, mm. I don't know if people are actually doing the best they can, but I do know that when I believe they are, it keeps me away from judgment. <clears throat> it helps me yeah. focus on what is happening in front of me and not what I think could be or should be happening in front of me. And and on the negative side of like people's behavior, I think the more that you spend time learning about what trauma does to people, what coping skills look like, um, and when people don't have solid coping skills, what that looks like in life. And that explains a whole lot of behavior that we see that we would say we don't like or that is negative or has negative impact. And so it really does help you to give people more grace and realize, oh, in light of the trauma they've experienced and the ways that they know how to to cope with things in life, they really are doing the best that they can. That's mm -hmm. not saying it that statement doesn't mean they're doing the best they could be. None of us are is doing the best that we could be in every moment. Or that can be done. Yeah. Right. It's just saying like uh, you know, according to to what we've experienced to this point, most of the time we're doing the best we can, you know, and I, it just promotes empathy. It's, it does. A way, it's, it's a way to promote empathy because you never know what someone else is going through. Yeah. Um, so I think that's helpful. And I think to the person's question that, that came in, I think, um, I, I can't answer the question for all churches everywhere. I can answer it sure. for here, right? And so our our vision statement, right, is is real life, real relationships, and real purpose. We want people to experience those things through a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so as far as like, uh, spiritual gifts and how, like we want that real purpose idea is the idea that we want to mobilize people. We want people to jump in and partner with kingdom work using the gifts that God has given them yeah. uh, to use. And so uh, that's something we really do promote. And we really desire for people to do uh, real relationships, people getting involved in group life, life groups, community groups. We want people to experience those relationships elsewhere. But that, that first connecting piece of like, what, what does it mean? It, it's the question of how do people really grow? I think that's been a question that's on, been on my mind a lot lately. How does a person grow? How does a Christian grow? How do you grow spiritually? And I think, to, for I have to think about it in three terms. One, there's what God does. There's what we do as individuals. And then from a church leadership standpoint, what, what systems or, or what practices does the church put in place to help reinforce that growth? And yeah. so we have to think in those terms. Um, obviously, we believe that God's the one who gives the growth right? That apart from God's at work in someone's life, they're not going to grow, at least not spiritually. Um, but the, it's that idea of, well, we, but we have an opportunity to partner with God in our own growth. And there are certain rhythms that we can um, walk into. So worship, I think worship is a big part of formation. That's a big, formation's a word that we've been using a lot on staff yeah. and, and among our pastors. How are people, how do we help ensure that people are being formed into the image of Christ? They're being made into disciples. Uh, we've been very intentionally with worship and and not just talking about worship as singing songs, yeah. but that everything we do on a Sunday morning is worship. Um, and so we're, we're, we, we know that worship forms people uh, and the rhythms that we, we allow to be part of our, or not that we allow, but the, the rhythms that we uh, are following the, of course, the scriptural um, uh, 
direction for on what our worship services look like, but then how we implement those and how regularly and intentionally we implement those things. I, I think all of that is at play in what it means to be a church that does the things that he's asking about. Yeah. And helping guide people through spiritual practices or spiritual <clears throat> disciplines, whatever terminology you want to use. So, uh, helping people learn like how to read the Bible, um, you know, not just, I mean, it's it's super important to engage with the scriptures regularly, but one of the benefits of being part of a church is that you can have people like you guys, um, like us, who have the benefit of spending more time uh, professionally, you know, throughout our day, we can, we can dive into deeper aspects of scripture and then share with congregation, like, this is how you can interpret uh, this type of literature found in the mm-hmm. scriptures. This is uh, how you can contextualize this properly. This is, you know, how we can contextualize it both for uh, the reader that had it initially and then how we can apply that to life now. Like, that is something that uh, we would say is a value of us gathering together, us uh, spending time together on a Sunday morning in the Word or in a community group uh, going through the Word together, or any of the studies that we're doing. It's it's gathering together and really helping people take information uh, and help that lead to transformation in their lives. That's exactly yeah, I, right. And I think what we're doing, um, at least this is my perspective on it, is when we have our weekend services, we are inviting people into practices and rhythms of, hey, this is what it looks like to worship God. Yeah. You know, we're going to invite you to worship in song, which is not just singing about God, but singing and worshiping God himself, mm-hmm. singing to God. Uh, we're going to invite you to worship through giving. We're going to uh, invite you to worship with your mind. And people have to choose, am I going to accept that invitation or mm-hmm. not? Um, but it, it would be our hope that people aren't just worshiping in that way on Sunday morning, but they're carrying those practices out through the week of, oh, I can continue to worship in song and in giving and in identifying my gifts and with my mind uh, all week long. Yeah, Um, absolutely. Yeah, so we want that to be, you know, what does a church look like? It's not just what happens on Sunday morning. It's what each individual and family continues to do in instilling those practices throughout the week. Yeah, this is kind of a microcosm of what our life should look like mm-hmm. on the daily, right? Like, it shouldn't be this completely separate, strange thing that we do, those various aspects of what we do together. Yeah. We should be replicating that in some way. Yeah, life like, isn't uh, church life here yeah. and then the rest of life over here. It's it's all encompassed. Yeah, it's good. Um, let's take a look. I want to get into a little bit more of a specific uh, part of that first question here. So, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, being a church that desires to reach lost people. And really, uh, again, just to kind of define that and, and address what we've already said, we look at people who don't know Jesus as lost. Um, and I think that that is such an important uh, framework to see that uh, is, people aren't, uh, you know, just some enemy of ours because they subscribe to some different ideology or they aren't uh, the worst people uh, that we encounter because they don't know. They're just lost. And it's uh, a welcome invitation for us to try to help them find their way, find Jesus. And so, we talked about that requires empathy. It requires seeing people as created in the image of God, whether they are following Jesus or not. Um, It requires us to have compassion toward people. And if we have that framework, then I think that we can be a better presence in the world that leads people toward Jesus. And so, it starts there, and I think that we're doing all we can uh, in all of our different environments, from our staff meetings to our leadership course that we'll talk about here in a minute, to the various groups that meet and all of the studies and different things that we are um, working really hard to try to encourage people to have compassion and empathy and to see people as human beings created in, in the image of God first and to cut through all of the other noise of our culture, of all of the division, all of the ideological separation, all of the us versus them a mentality that has pervaded Christian culture for years. And 
and really bringing people to a place where they can see the world around them and see it as as lost and in need of Jesus and not just uh, something to hide from or to fight against. And so we are, I, I think, uh, attempting to do that. Hopefully we're doing that uh, fairly well. Uh, we are speaking truth, and that's a primary thing that we're doing on Sunday mornings when we preach, and then again in those other environments that we've talked about, we're exploring uh, what we believe is true about reality, and everything that we do is based in uh believing that the reality is that Jesus is uh, the Savior of the world and that we're trying to point people to Him. And so, the last part of this then is, given all of those things, if we, if we are a church that is doing those things, then the other side of that with those who... Um, who do know Jesus and who are being formed by Him and are attempting to be formed in His image, uh, then what are we doing to encourage and enable people to use their gifts? Uh, we have a couple things that we had talked about kind of before this conversation that we thought uh, are good examples of, of how we're doing that. So, I'll turn that over maybe to you guys to talk about those couple things. One of the things that we talked about <clears throat> uh, and that we're we're moving forward on is, um, uh, so I guess earlier this year around January or February, we started, uh, we opened it up to the whole church, uh, and it was a Christian leadership development group, which meets once a month. And that group has, um, kind of the, the purpose behind it is to, um, open up to people and find out, do they have a desire to lead in any capacity within the church? Uh, and and outworking of that, uh, one of the ways that I'll know that's we're moving in the right direction is um, that people will feel the call to move into um, more board, uh, elder level, pastoral level ministry, and then also deacon, uh, which we would just define as kind of a lead servant, mm -hmm. um, that they would want to serve the church in a higher capacity. Um, and so man, one of the things we're doing with that, we've got a really good group of people right now, uh, but we've been walking through different, it's really broken. That's going to be an 18, about 18 month process. Uh, that first trimester we looked at was a lot of gospel and theology. Um, this one that we're moving into right now is more defining the terms and roles of elders and deacons or pastors and deacons. Uh, and then, uh, in the spring, we'll be looking at a lot of cultural and social issues and, and what are the ways that we can, um, navigate those together as a leadership team. So that's, that's one of the ways that we've invited people, uh, deeper and try, are trying to help form people uh, and 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 really think very thoughtfully about uh, how how we navigate those challenges and, and how we lead from a place of understanding and wisdom. Yeah, but beyond that, I mean, we really desire for people to serve. Um, not only using spiritual gifts, but just even the talents, natural ab abilities and talents. I look today, we've got a sermon series coming up, our Advent series. We outsourced it. Do you guys know this? And it, the artwork was drawn by one of the teenage girls in our church, and it's incredible. Oh, awesome. I got to see it today. And so um, it's just that kind of stuff that God has gifted each one of us uniquely um, to serve the church in some way. And so um, to be a blessing, not only to the church and the gathering of the believers, but also to the world and the people around us. Yeah. So I would say those are some examples of ways that we call people into that, into that, if that makes sense. Yep. And then we've got group life that kind of takes place as well, which is another environment that Justin oversees uh, where we are encouraging people to, on a smaller scale, get to know each other more relationally. And I think one of the benefits of that is um, oftentimes, I don't know what your guys' experience has been, but oftentimes um, whenever I've grown in a gift or grown in a desire to serve Jesus, it's been because someone else that I was in relationship with kind of saw something in me and spoke to it, encouraged me mm -hmm. that way. I think there's there is a lot that we can do sort of from the stage to encourage people, but I really think there's more encouragement that happens in those smaller groups when you know somebody and you know that they kind of know you. Oh, for sure. You know, when somebody who's who has proximity to you says something encouraging, that carries more weight than, than just, uh, you know, I think even like my experience is, uh, I stand on a stage regularly and I sing and that uses like a talent that I have. And I, I do appreciate when 
somebody who's been out in the auditorium says like, hey, that sounded great this morning, or they encouraged me in some way in that. Like, I, I do appreciate that. Um, I don't mean to sound like I don't, but I appreciate so much more when there's somebody who knows me and they encourage me in some way about my character, about mm-hmm. something else, mm-hmm. like that carries more weight than just the, you know, something that happens sort of a little bit more removed from the stage. And so I think the point that I'm just trying to make is that, you know, the things that we do on the broad scale to the broad conversation congregation from the stage. Um, you know, I think it's limited at some point, the encouragement that we can provide. And so we try to provide these other environments where you have proximity to people oh, yeah. who get to know you. And that's really where I would say I see the 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 value of of encouragement really having uh more of a, a an ability to help people along in, in that process. I would absolutely agree with that. That's good. So yeah, I think um Hopefully we've we've done an okay job of of answering that question. I want to move on here. This was uh, kind of a more specific question, again from the same person uh, that we felt like we've already sort of been discussing recently in a couple sermons. Um, I spoke back in July and kind of talked a little bit about the importance of. Um, seeing people for people, humanizing them, uh, talking about the discourse that we have in regard to people, and and especially in a culture that uh, is clinging uh, very much to various ideologies right now, and they're sort of two dominant political ideologies mm-hmm. that seem to be warring yep. against each other, and what that's doing, in my opinion, to actually deform people. Um and so then, Justin, you spoke a couple weeks ago uh, out of the book of Daniel talking about really um, what it looks like to follow Jesus is not um, 100% leaning one way or the other ideologically that, that Jesus uh, presents a third way. And I'll let you kind of unpack that for us. But this was the question that we received, and, and I think that we've already kind of been having these conversations, and it's something that we want to continue to gently um, guide people toward. And here, so here's the question. Uh, what does it look like to balance concepts gladly embraced by one political party? And the example here uh, is given, such as, uh, the one who doesn't work won't eat, uh, against those of another embraced by the other party in terms of uh, the poor, like, what did you do? Uh, what you did to the least of these you did unto me. So kind of the idea of, um, you know, I think we would identify that uh, one political ideology would value hard work and rewarding hard work based on merit. Yeah. yeah. And then the other is um, a political ideology that embraces um, helping people kind of no matter what, um, not based on merit. Um, And so, I think that's definitely represented in our culture. Um, that's one of the aspects of the culture war that's that's raging right now. But uh, I'd be interested to see, like, kind of what do we feel like uh, the Bible and following Jesus has to say about how to balance uh, between those. Yeah. Um, so just to backtrack a little bit, um, I did do the message there a couple of Sundays ago. And um, the way I set it up was... Just identifying that that there's a lot of biblical scholars that break down the scriptures into two different themes, and it's not it's not the themes of good and evil. It's not it's not the yin and yang. It's not even love and hate or, or love and fear, um, but it's either the path of shalom or peace, uh, and the path of empire uh, or power, success, prestige, um, and and we have to choose. Hey, what path are we walking on here? And um, I made the point toward the end of the message. I didn't. I didn't really make the point. I kind of asked the question, but in asking the question, I think I made the point. <laughs> um, uh, you know, is either political party in America today uh, really trying to embrace and follow the path to peace, or is each political party following the path to power and mm-hmm. success? And um, you know, it's a challenging question for people to wrestle with uh, a bit. Yeah. What was the exact question there? Just uh, Yeah, so it was, what does it like look like to balance um, kind of 
those concepts. Like, yeah. Uh, and I would say, well, I don't want to give it away too hard, but I think that it's maybe less of a balance and more of a third way of looking at things, which you, you sort of identified. You gave us uh, a good framework that I felt like was helpful for that. Yeah. And, <laughs> so there's those five things that you gave us was a good example that kind of talks about um not really having uh not really having as much of a compromise between two things. Yeah. So in the message I was just quoting um you know I'm quoting John Mark Comer who's quoting somebody else. Yeah. So John Mark Comer's a, a pastor and author uh in in his book Live No Lies he was quoting uh, a book titled Destroyer of the Gods, which is um, just about early Christianity. You know, you got this really small group of, you know, Jewish Christians in very, very early Christianity who, over a period of just a few hundred years, uh, grew to the point of overtaking the Roman Empire. Um and five of the, you know, marks, uh, five distinctive features that they lived by. Uh, the church was multiracial and multi-ethnic. They had a high value for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, the church was spread aco- across socioeconomic lines. There was a high value for caring for the poor. Those with extra were expected to share with those with less. Uh, the church was active uh, it was staunch in its active resistance to infanticide and abortion. Uh, it was resolute in its vision of marriage and sexuality as between one man and one woman for life. And it was nonviolent, both on a personal level and a political level. And uh, John Mark Kermit just goes on to make the point that if you, you know, break down those five um, marks there, two of them would uh, pretty easily fall into a uh, left uh, political ideology. Two of them would pretty easily fall into an ideology on the right. And then the one where uh, violence is, um, you know, that being nonviolent, that doesn't really fall into either political ideology today. Um, the simple reality is that early Christianity, the vast majority of people, were pacifists and completely and totally nonviolent. And, um, you know, I think that the culture that we are in today with these political battles back and forth is that um, people aren't willing to, you know, some people aren't willing to take this middle road and adhere to, oh, hey, that, there's good principle here and there's a good principle here. Um, people are making a political ideology like their identity. Um, you know, they're really getting into this identity politics and, oh, okay, I'm a Republican, so I have to be a Republican in everything. Or I'm a Democrat and I have to be a Democrat in everything. And the simple reality is, is that we are followers of Jesus and we have to be followers of Jesus in everything. And uh, I think when we are followers of Jesus, we have to be uh, consistent in our values. We can't, you know, we can't say about one uh political person over here, well, they shouldn't do that, and have somebody over here in another political party do the same thing and then defend their actions because they're in our political party. You know, like that just isn't, um, you know, that's not being consistent. But your question, you know, this person's question is all about consistency. Hey, uh, people need to work or they don't eat. That's a biblical principle. And there's another biblical principle that says, Uh, what you've done for the least of these you've done for me, are those two principles at odds with one another? Mm. And uh, my simple answer to that question is no. Um, There aren't any major contradictions in the scriptures. Um, You know, if you read through the the Proverbs, every once in a while you see different Proverbs that you can be like, well, which is it? Is it this or is it this? And the simple answer is it depends on the situation and the circumstances at hand. Um, Mm. There are times when uh, you know, as a pastor, I've been in a clear situation in which, oh, giving to the least of these here um, is is necessary. Mm-hmm. And this person really does need food or fuel mm-hmm. or whatever it is. Like I can, you know, you can just tell from the conversation and asking the questions and, and seeing the tears in their eyes, this person really needs help. And you're not running that through a grid of merit. 
which right. is one of the points, Daniel, that you made that that first one, he who does not work, does not eat, is sort of sort of that meritocracy idea. Yeah, I. If you guys will indulge me, I've, I've just been trying to formulate my thoughts on this. I, uh, when I'm preaching, I have probably three very high values. Probably the highest is to always get to the gospel, get to Jesus. The second is that I have I explained the text correctly. But the third is when I'm talking to people that I've walked through, and I don't ever say, I don't think I've ever said this, but like a value of mine is that when I'm talking to people, that I try to engage their head, their heart, and their hands. I'm trying to engage all three of those things. And so on this, for, with regard to this question, I'll, let me let me try to hit all three of those. The, the With the head, I'll tell you this. I um, I just started working through a book. I just got through the introduction. I'm, just, I'm halfway through chapter one. But, uh, and it's, it's got a spicy title to it. It's a book by Christopher Watkin, and it's entitled uh, Biblical Critical Theory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Biblical Critical Theory by Christopher Watkin, and I'm fascinated by it. It's very, very esoteric. By the three pages you've read so far. Uh, (laughs) The introduction was like 50 pages. It's it's long. Uh, But um, what what he's seeking to do is to create a biblical, uh, a a social theory, a social theory based on scripture, which by the way, is a good impulse. One of the things that, Mm -hmm. you know, the Reformation did is it, it, before the Reformation with Martin Luther and John Calvin and those guys, there was a, a vast sacred and secular divide. And the Reformation said there is no such thing. There is no all things are sac- are sacred, right? Um, and yet uh, we live in a world that is highly secularized, right? Uh, that doesn't that wants to remove the sacred from our experience. And his whole point is, you, no, why why do you have to do that, Christians? Um, but but I, I think as much as Christians want to say we are thoroughly Christian, we we are swimming in such secular waters that we almost, we're just, it's just kind of how we are. Like we have to navigate a secular world. Uh, and there's so much within us that is secular and not sacred. And so what he's working through in this is to kind of put together a, a biblical Christian social theory. Um, but one of the terms that he go, and I think it, it, you most clearly said it, Sean earlier, this idea of a third way, not a, not one side or the other, not one extreme or the other, or one polarizing point or another, not, not a compromise, not the middle of those two, a different way. He, he unpacks that. He has this idea called diagonalization. I think it's the idea of it's, it's not what, what this extreme right position is or what this extreme left position is. And it's not somewhere in the middle because you're playing a game that is, uh, it's man-made, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas if you look at what the scripture says, both of those are true. The one who doesn't work shouldn't eat, and also you must do this to the least of these. That's a third way. It's not a middle way. It's not a compromise. It's compassion for the poor, and it's also God has given you gifts to work, so work. Um, that's an example of that that he would unpack throughout. And so that's okay. if I'm looking at, at those things from the head uh, standpoint, that's how I would answer that question. Let me get to the heart, though. Um, this is my story. This is a personal thing for me. Uh, at a church where I previously served, by the way, labels are helpful until they're not. I'll give a label. I'll throw a label out there, and if it's helpful, great. If it's not, great. Uh, uh, I would consider myself uh, very conservative, politically speaking. I am in a conservative camp, um, uh, and I was at a point. <clears throat> where I said these words out loud in confidence to another pastor friend of mine. I wasn't preaching this way or talking this way. I always try to have compassion. But I I got to the point of saying, I cannot see, I cannot understand how you can be a Democrat and be a Christian, or you can be a liberal or progressive and be a Christian. I cannot understand it. And he looked at me with such kindness and such gentleness and such boldness. And he said, then there's something wrong with your understanding of, of, mm. of God and Christianity. He said, and, and really what he said was, you've got a log in your eye. Yeah, That's the biblical language he used. Daniel, I love you. You have a log in your eye. Mm-hmm. You need to remove that log before you can see. And so that really sent me on a journey. Yeah. Um, and by the way, after completing that journey, I didn't move left. I'm still, uh, I would consider myself very conservative. And yet I had to come to a place where I realized you can have different perspectives that lean one way or the other, and you can be 
a God honoring Christian Mm -hmm. and there is complexity. Um, So it forced me to look at the shortcomings and failures and the sins of conservative values. Yeah. It forced me to look at the log in my own eye. And once I was able to remove that, I could see more clearly. And so with my hands, what did that change in me? Um, For me, it gave me greater empathy for people. Uh, exactly. We, we, it's, I'm ending where we started today. Mm-hmm. Seeing people as created in the image of God for the glory of God, knowing that it was also a lesson I had to learn where I understood not everyone sees the world like I see it and thinks, but not, their brains don't think like my brain thinks. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing. That's, that is actually a that means that God is more creative than just creating one type of brain. Yeah. You know? So can I cut in here on that point? Well, I, all I want to say is I I do <laughs> no. I no. No. All I want I because I do it was it was a transformative conversation for me in which I still landed in many of the same ways in the same camp with regard to how I see the world and government and and all those kind of things and economics, but it helped me to see people as people and not as opposition and to see the image of God within them. And so how that's worked out in my hands is in my conversations with people. I ask a lot of questions and I'm much kinder uh, and, and, and not as short. Uh, and in my teaching and preaching, it's very important to me to understand. I have friends in this church who are on bo- like, uh, opposite ends of the spectrum mm-hmm. politically, yep. right? I mean, like opposite, opposite. Uh, and understanding that the grace of God is, is there for both of them and that that the way of Jesus is not one side or the other, or even a compromise. It truly is a third way. Um, That's been very important for me to, uh, that's, I wanted to share my heart with that. And hopefully that was helpful for people and not, you didn't just hear, Oh, that pastor's a conservative. I'm out. Right. Like I hope. Well, and being able to, to identify readily the shortcomings of, completely going down a conservative American conservative of which ideological are path. Right. Uh, the ways that that completely diverges mm-hmm. from following Jesus ways that that, uh, completely, f- uh, comes into being formed more by humanism than it is by Jesus. Like, so that is something that I've seen in you too, is that it's not just, um, Hey, I fall on this side, and and so everything that falls on this side is uh, f- is the way that a Christian should live. Like right. there are many many things on the conservative American political side of the spectrum that are not the way of Jesus, and so that's something that we readily have identified. Have we we talk about there are things again on the on the left that we would say at some point that path diverges from the way of Jesus and we have to plot a third way. What I'm hoping this conversation right now does is that, uh, and, and I said this in, in my message on Daniel a few weeks ago, that I think there, the extremes to avoid are uh, totally reject or totally receive, right? Mm-hmm. And it's a redemption. Redeeming is what our, our, our value should be wherever we are in the world. And so I think for me, uh, having a conversation, there are two extremes with regard to this conversation uh, to avoid. And one of those is you, we, sh- we should just duke it out right now. Like, right? Like, take to, you take one standpoint, I'll take the other one, and let's fight it out, which is what most of our political debates have turned into these days, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the other is to not have a conversation at all. Mm-hmm. Be- and, and, uh, and I think that is another direction that people go. Uh, but when you do that, people aren't able to understand how to have a good conversation. Like you've got to be able to say you and I see this differently and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have, if you can't have those conversations in a meaningful and Christ honoring way, and we, if we as pastors can't model those things, then, then we're not actually being of any service and we're not actually moving the kingdom forward. And so I, I just think, you know, I really feel like I co-opted a lot of this conversation. I've been talking for a long time. Justin, what did you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right when you wanted to cut me off 10 minutes ago. <laughs> I, was, I, I was just going to say, like, this is a point that I communicated with um, all of our community group leaders uh, when we had a training Sunday afternoon. Um, you know, there are times in my life when 
I'm confronted by somebody who has a very different perspective than me on whatever topic, whether it's uh, whether it is a spiritual, a theological, a political, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the topic is, they have a very different perspective than me. And uh, there's, you know, a principle that I tell myself, which is, if I lived this person's life and experienced everything that they've experienced, would I have a different perspective than they have right Mm -hmm. here? Probably not. And if they lived my life and experienced everything I've experienced, uh, you know, same same principle goes that way, too. Uh, But one other thought, too, is that, um, you know, we are... Because of those experiences, we get in our minds our perspective has to be the right one. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, it was, I don't know, it, it's been a number of years now when um, somebody challenged a, a room full of pastors that I was sitting in. Um, hey, just look over the books that you've read this year. How many of them were written by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants? Mm-hmm. Um, furthermore, how, how many of them were written by white Anglo-Saxon Protestant men, uh, as opposed to women? And, um, you know, I just kind of started thinking through the books I'd been reading and I was like, wow, that's really interesting. Um, probably 95% of the books I've read over the past five years were written in that category. And, uh, so I just took the challenge on myself, like, okay, I'm going to read a book every month by somebody who is not a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And just start to get some other perspectives. And, uh, you know, I read a lot of books on the topic of race and racial reconciliation that year from very different voices. And I ended that entire year like, wow, um, this conversation is so big. Uh, There's somebody at the table with a Martin Luther King uh, peaceful protest mindset. There's somebody sitting at the table... Uh, with like a, a Malcolm X, you know, power kind of uh, mindset. There's somebody else at the table with this other perspective. And you, know, you got all these different perspectives. And I'm like, I understand why the topic is so big and broad now, mm-hmm. because um, wherever you fall, you're still one of eight perspectives around the table. And it just opened up my eyes a lot to uh, that, hey, I just have to recognize first, this person's created by God in the image of God for the glory of God. Can we find a way to love each other, even if we have a different perspective on this topic, whatever the topic might be? Mm. Yeah. To your point of generating conversation, I think I, I think back to my college experience, and I got maybe one of the greatest gifts Ever looking back on it, I I look at this professor and what he did in this class as one of the greatest gifts that at the time I didn't even know how valuable it was going to be. Hmm. And it was this class we read through this talk about esoteric books. It was this book this thick called Kingdom Ethics, hmm. and it was a book that ran uh, you know ethics and worldview through the lens of the Sermon on the Mount. But it was very uh, academic in nature. And what we did with that is, so it was, you know, topical inside of that. And so, you'd look at a a topic and what he did was he artificially formed groups, just said, okay, you, 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 and you are in this group and you're this side of this issue. (laughs) <laughs> you, 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 you are uh-huh. this group, and you're the opposite side of the issue. And next class, we're going to come together. He called them symposiums. We're going. To, you're going to research this, run it through. You're going to come up with a defense, more or less, or an explanation for this side, whether you personally agree with it or not. Your object is going to be to set up like an argument for this side. Mm-hmm. And then each side is going to have whatever it was, 10 minutes to present. And then we're going to spend the remainder of the class talking about the places where we can come together on this issue. And the goal by the end of this is not for one side or the other to have won a debate. It is for both sides to see where we can have common ground and Hmm. to move forward. And at the time, you know, this was 2008. 
And I was also, you know, in my mid 20s. And so whatever combination of our culture wasn't as divided as it is now, plus I just wasn't as aware as a 23 year old, right? The implications for this. I look at that now and I go, if only that was the way that we had discourse in the church, if that was the way that we had discourse in our society. I think we would be on such a better track. Mm -hmm. And what I've appreciated about being on staff here um, and the direction that we're going uh, is that we do tend to try to have conversations that propel us forward uh, with common ground that doesn't get caught up in Mm -hmm. trying to win debates, uh, doesn't get caught up in uh, trying to be right. We're concerned with getting it right. Yeah. And that's the type of environment that I think we're trying to foster yeah. here. I mean, I think just all of these topics, um, you know, especially when you get into the political ideologies today, um, they're just so abrasive. And everybody thinks I'm right. And like my very generic overview of some things in the Old Testament is, um, you know, essentially the people of Israel, the people of God um, really had a lack of humility. Mm -hmm. They felt like, hey, God is on our side. He chose us, so He's on our side. Instead of saying, we're the people of God, they were saying, God is on our side. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think people get into some of these topics, and they have a mindset of, this is right, Mm -hmm. and God is on my side on this topic, and you need to hear the truth. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I... One of those questions you read earlier had that word truth in it, like mm-hmm. you want to speak the truth. And um, my experience with that is, you know, people get in this mindset of, hey, it's true, and it just needs to be said. And I'm like, well, maybe maybe it doesn't need to be said, or it doesn't need to be said in that tone. Mm, yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> you, Jesus never started a conversation by saying, hey, let's talk about your sin problem. Yeah. Uh, he didn't start conversations that way. And uh, so I don't want to start conversations that way. It certainly doesn't need to be said if there's no amount of humility in you and there's no ability. If you haven't already done the work that we've talked about several times today of that's a person created in the image of God for the glory of God, if you haven't done that work, then you really... It's not time for you to speak whatever mm-hmm. truth you feel like you need to speak. Yeah, another way to say it is, if, if you have to ask, is it unloving to tell somebody this? If you have to ask the question, it's probably unloving. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully that uh, has answered uh, a bit of that question. I do want to just say to that person, you probably recognize uh, who you are, your questions have been extremely thoughtful and in depth, and we've done our best over the last few months to to get to some of those, and then some of the other ones, uh, we we we're just kind of formulating how we may talk about those, um, whether it's whether we would talk about them in this type of format or whether that's more of a, a an individual conversation. But I just do want to say to that person, if you're still uh, watching Rich <laughs> talk after all with these, us, yeah. after these months, thank you for what you submitted. It was very thoughtful, very reasoned and well thought out. And uh, we do appreciate uh, all of those as well as the other things that uh, people have submitted. We've had some really good uh, mm. questions lately, and hopefully we are are helping you guys navigate some of those things and really come to an understanding. We appreciate those of you who are consistently uh, listening or watching, and we hope that you are blessed today. <laughs>